And as a mom, I'm very worried. I'm terrified. This is not how I wanted to set him up for education. In our ongoing investigation into classrooms in crisis, we've heard stories from teachers who experience constant disruption, even violence in schools. But tonight, we're hearing a side of a story we haven't yet. Let's get right to KGW investigator Kristen Severance. You've been on this story, of course, Kristen, from the beginning. We've learned this is a huge issue affecting so many people, not just teachers. Really affecting entire families. Yeah. So tonight, we're going to hear from a mom of a little boy struggling with these disruptive incidents why she thinks this is happening and what districts should be doing differently. And we talked to psychologists about why they think so many kids, again, not special needs students, are having these outbursts. I thought, you know what, it's about time we start talking about this. Alicia Sherman could completely relate to our Classrooms in Crisis investigation, where teachers explained what's happening in schools across Oregon. Literal screaming, like they're screaming for help, literally. And so sometimes that comes out in, you know, suicide threats or death threats. They are throwing furniture, they're running through the building, going to the office, throwing chairs at windows. But she's not teaching a child struggling with outbursts. She's raising one. From almost the first week of school, we started getting phone calls saying, Luca is screaming, he's crying, he's acting out, he's um, not enjoying school. Alicia says her five-year-old son, Luca, and nearly half of the 28 kids in his kindergarten class have these outbursts. He's in a general education classroom, not a special needs student. My husband and I looked at each other and just said, this doesn't happen at home. This is learned behavior here at school. She tried talking to her son, his teacher, even Luca's doctor. She checked him out and she said, Luca's just not enjoying school and there's some resources at school that will be helpful to him and you need to go back to the school and have the school help, when, which I did and they said um, there just is not enough resources to help him. They said they're all tapped out. Yes. There are a lot of theories about these disruptive incidents. One of them is trauma, that these kids experience homelessness or they come from single parent households. Mm -hmm. That is the opposite here, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. You don't have any of those issues. No, I mean, I, we have a healthy family life. Luca has, you know, everything he needs for a healthy life. A recent Oregon Education Association report blames disrupted learning on a number of factors, including large class sizes, not enough student support, and a marked decrease in things like PE and recess. We have no physical education. Um, holidays have been taken away, no celebrations, you know, and they need these type of things to, um, to have emotional balance. And when you take away these things, you're left with a bunch of kids that don't know how to deal with their emotions. And then that causes, obviously, behavioral issues. This is something we heard several times while doing follow-up stories and interviews after Classrooms in Crisis first aired. Not have the focus be so much pressure on our kinders to, you know, meet certain benchmarks. Okay, let's go, let's go. Kathy Crocker retired early from the Hillsborough School District after 26 years as a counselor in part because of the increase in disruptive behaviors in young kids and the lack of support to help them. Make um, kindergarten more developmentally appropriate, allow kids to have centers where they learn social skills. They're not learning the social skills. They're simply not developmentally ready. School psychologist Michelle Eddie Merlot and behavior specialist Sandy Washburn work for the Greater Albany Public School District. They say students from kindergarten to 12th grade are suffering from anxiety. It was rare that I would see um, a child with anxiety. Now it's 60 percent. Um, it's significant. It's huge. The seniors this year in school are the 9-11 kids. And so immediately from that point, all across the country, our feeling of safety and our anxiety as grown-ups went up a notch. And we haven't really addressed that. Our kids are taking all of that in like a sponge. And in terms of, in you know, they just can't process it. What do you do with that? There's so much more that we need to start talking about. Alicia is trying to make sense of it all. She knows she could transfer her son to a school that offers more time for things like PE, but worries about leaving his classmates behind. If I pull my kids out, um, this district will lose a voice that speaks out on behalf of all the other kids that need someone to 
um, stand up and fight for this such a complex issue. Oh, yes. you know, it's so wide ranging. So we did reach out to the Park Row School District where Alicia's son goes to school. The superintendent said they are addressing disrupted learning. They're training teachers, especially with trauma informed care. As for physical education, he wants to bring it back to the elementary schools, but he says they're facing a big budget shortfall. $1.9 million next year, so they really can't. It seems so absurd not yes, to have PE, it such sure a big does. mistake, but it does come down to money. Mm -hmm. And the legislature is looking at a budget right now of $100 million less than what Governor Brown proposed last fall. Mm -hmm. So I understand teachers did something about it today. What'd they do? They did. Teachers are really upset about this. We just got video of this about uh, 30 minutes ago. So they went all over our area on overpasses. They held signs saying class size counts. They put up banners. They want to raise awareness about what they call a funding crisis across the state. They're planning to walk out of classrooms on May 8th. Wow. Well, maybe yeah. they'll get lawmakers attention. Yes. Yeah, they're trying to and there's so much more to come on this, you know, from teacher burnout to, yeah. you know, lawsuits. So we'll continue to follow this. Boy, right. it affects so many. Kristen, thank, thank you. you. And you a reminder, if you have a story for Kristen to investigate, just give her a call 503-226-5041 or you can always email call Kristen at KGW.com. Three days after a plane crash in Ethiopia killed 157 people, today every single Boeing 737 MAX 8 and MAX 9 aircraft is on the ground. President Trump announced that order today after talking with the FAA. It was so sudden that planes were getting ready to take off and they had to stop and turn around. The reason the MAX 8 is being grounded is because it was the model involved in this crash in Africa but it was also involved in another crash last fall in Indonesia. Pilots have been notified. Uh, airlines have been all notified. Airlines are agreeing with this. The safety of the American people and all people is our paramount concern. The MAX 9 is just a bigger version of the 8, so it was also grounded. The U.S. says they were the last nation worldwide to ground the flights shortly after Canada made a similar call this morning. Let's bring in KGW's Morgan Romero now. She's live at PDX where she talked to passengers and she spoke with a University of Portland professor about impacts of the grounding. Morgan? A PDX public information officer says Southwest was the only airline scheduled to have a 737 MAX fly in here. One was set to come in on Saturday, but still some flights are impacted here today as they are across the country. A line wound around at the Southwest check-in. Travelers whose flights were delayed or canceled told it's because of weather or the grounding of Boeing 737 MAX 8 aircrafts. I no longer have a boarding pass, <laughs> so we have to find out which one it is. Passengers applauding the FAA, President and Boeing for taking caution. I'm glad that uh, a chance is not going to be taken. If it's a software issue or something like that and it's resolved, then uh, I'd, let, I'd rather wait until it's resolved. If there's flaws in it, then I mean, that's pretty much my life, so I'm not going to risk my life for a, a flight pretty much. It is kind of spooky. I University of Portland professor of finance and transportation, Dr. Richard Gritta, says these fatal plane crashes are rare, but he's glad the FAA issued the emergency order. Unsettling that the same model airplane, which is new, has these incidents. Sunday's deadly crash in Ethiopia, coming five months after one in Indonesia. The FAA says data shows possible similarities between the two crashes. There was a problem controlling the plane because it was trying to force the nose down and the pilots were trying to get it back up. Same thing appears to be in this case uh, with, with the, the 737 MAX. Um, that it's a pilot control issue. Dr. Gritta says it could be a software glitch. But they were supposed to train people how to defuse the system. In a statement, Boeing said they support the action to temporarily ground operations out of an abundance of caution, even though they have full confidence in the safety of the aircraft. Well, their stock price crashed, but again, that, that's not unexpected, you know, after an incident like that, especially two following very closely upon each other. At PDX Wednesday, some travelers saying they still trust the jet. I saw two incidents in the how many flights do we have. Percentage wise, it would be so low, I would feel comfortable. 
The FAA says Ethiopian flight data and voice recorders will be sent to France to be analyzed. This will tell investigators exactly what happened and if the crashes were the same in Indonesia and in Ethiopia. Back to you. Thank you, Morgan Romero, live at PDX. You heard Morgan talking to passengers saying, some of them saying they would feel safe still. We want to know what you think in our KGW viewer voice poll. Would you feel safe flying on a Boeing 737 MAX 8 or 9? Let us know at kgw.com slash vote, or you can vote on your KGW app. Just click on the tile that says viewer voice. We'll have the final results for you at the end of the newscast. Skiers and boarders are loving the conditions at Mount Hood. All that snow last month provided a big boost to the snowpack. KGW meteorologist Joe Ranieri went up to the mountain to check it out. Drive around government camp and you'd never guess it's nearly mid-March with all of the snow that still covers the ground. Last couple weeks, insane. It's just been dumping nonstop all the time. And it's just as nice up in the higher elevations around the ski resorts. Yeah, today was a nice surprise. <laughs> We got up here a little late, it was a little tracked up, but uh, we keep finding nice little pockets. Where skiers and snowboarders spent the day on more than a foot of fresh powder. It's pretty awesome. I'm used to Colorado and I wasn't expecting this much powder. I heard it was like wet snow up here, so this is unusual. Dave Tragathon with Mount Hood Meadows says last month is when winter came back to life. February was amazing. Shortest month and 130 inches of snow right here in the base area during February. That's nothing compared to what they've seen so far this winter. So far this season, we've received 351 inches of snow. Our average for the entire season is 430. So yeah, we, we have been having a sensational season. Thanks to the heavy snow the mountains have been seeing, Oregon snowpack is improving compared to just a couple of months ago. According to the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the snowpack in the Hood, Sandy, and Lower Deschutes basins around Mount Hood are at 93% of normal. The rest of the state is well above normal. Tragathon says this is going to really help as we get closer into spring and summer. The more snowpack we have now, the more reservoirs are going to be filled, uh, the more uh, the salmon are going to enjoy it. What will also help, a couple more late winter or early spring storms. I think it's been a fantastic season so far. We've been spoiled. Fantastic is a good way to describe it. That was Joe Ranieri reporting for us. Coming up, how a local couple gave kids in 27 countries a way to stay active in a brand new Those Who Serve. And later, we learn how many families were caught up in the largest calling cheating scam in known history. I'm Matt Safino. The clouds are clearing across the state. There's Mount Hood right now with all of its deep snow. That's viewed from our camera out in the Dallas on the Oregon Veterans Home. Meanwhile, here in town, clouds lazily floating around, but the showers are ending. We've got a warm spell and a dry spell beginning pretty much right now.